Um, I'm Professor Andrea Flores from the Department of Education. And to give you a sense of our plan for today, uh, Professor Escudero and I are both going to talk about our recently published books in the field of migration studies. My book is called, called The Succeeders. Uh, Professor Escudero's book is called Organizing While Undocumented. And then we're going to talk about the newly launched uh, Migration Studies Initiative here at Brown. You. All right, and then we'll talk about the Migration Studies Initiative, which recently launched, uh, and that Professor Escudero and I uh, co-direct. So this is my, my book cover uh, for The Succeeders, How Immigrant Youth Are Transforming What It Means to Belong in the United States. And this is a, I'm an anthropologist by training, and this means that I do ethnographic research, which uh, I conducted an extended period of field work between 2012 and 2013. Uh, I did preliminary field work for around three months the two previous summers, and I've been returning to my field site of Nashville, Tennessee since then uh, for uh, every January and every summer. And there are kind of some main methods uh, in, in anthropological work. And Margaret Mead, who's probably the most famous anthropologist that maybe you've heard of, said what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are three different things. So for that reason, we have a very eclectic set of methods. So the hallmark is participant observation, which is going to the, the field site, seeing what people are doing, how they're doing it, how they behave, where they sit, right? No one's in the front row here. That would be a, something I would put in my notes. Um, I did interviews with 31 focal participants who I selected based on how they mapped onto the broader um, demographics of the organization I was working with. Document analysis of um, the materials that students collect and create in the process of becoming college ready and expert interviews with uh, college admissions officers, teachers, and the people who ran this program. So to go back to this picture, the program, I give the pseudonym The Succeeders. It was a college access program for Latinx immigrant and immigrant descendant youth in Nashville, Tennessee. It served, uh, I'll get to kind of uh, a little bit more about who it served and why, but to give you a sense of Nashville, probably what comes to your head when you think about it might be bachelorette parties, if you've uh, been down there. Cowboy hats, cowboy boots, hot chicken, right? Uh, the Grand Old Opry. Uh, but Nashville is a, a, one of what we, in the literature, call a new destination of migration. Uh, not a place that historically has been known for international migration, but rather one that's had a lot of internal migration, people coming from throughout the region to work in, in its various industries, um, which overall have been insurance, and uh, um, particularly around uh, medical insurance. And the population is about half a million. 12% now are foreign born. That reaches the historical highs of the early part of the 20th century, where we think of the, the great migrations coming from Europe at the time. So we don't necessarily think of Nashville as a place that would be having so many migrant folks, but it actually is reaching what we thought of as the heights at, uh, in an earlier part of our history. The largest population is the Latino population, about 10% of the, the city's entire population. Uh, since 2001, Nashville's also been part of the building the New American Community Initiative which uh, resettles refugee populations in cities that historically have not been gateways for refugees. Um, however, because there's a large meatpacking and tourist industry there, the notion was that this would be a place that refugees would be easily assimilated into the workforce and the low cost of living at the time would also allow for that. The largest population is Kurdish folks from uh, Iraq and kind of the greater Middle East. Um, and in the uh, aftermath of the, the Iraq war, it was one of the two sites where the, um, the diaspora could vote in the first presidential election after uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein. 
Okay. So now we have this city that historically has been thought about in terms of a black-white binary, like most of the Southeast, with an influx of new diverse populations. So what happened when I was speaking to, to teachers and uh, support staff in schools was this introduced a lot of linguistic and cultural diversity into a system that did not feel prepared for it. And so, um, as you see here, it's 20% Latino in the height, in the, uh, throughout MNPS, Metro Nashville Public Schools. Uh, and there are 120 languages spoken in Nashville Public Schools, which is the same amount as in New York City. Graduation rates were very disparate for ELL, or English language learner population, and Latinx students. So we see the overall graduation rate is around uh, in the mid 80s and we see here that both of those populations are well below that. Because of the influx of migrant populations, multi-language multi learners, and the school system feeling kind of overwhelmed by that, we saw an influx of community partner organizations coming in to work with Metro to kind of provide professional development, college access programming, cultural competency, uh, training for, for the entirety of the workforce. And at one point, 174 nonprofits were working uncoordinated with Metro Nashville Public Schools with no central organization until a, another nonprofit was formed to manage the nonprofits. But none of that was actually built into the structure of the schools themselves. And the folks I spoke to said that this created a lot of extra services, but a difficult to navigate web of them, particularly for folks who are just learning English and are trying to learn how the US school system works in order to best serve their learners. So this is where the Succeeders program comes in. Um, Succeeders, as I mentioned, is the pseudonym I'm giving to this organization that was formed to kind of deal with this um, discrepancy in graduation rates for the Latinx population. And it was, had initially formed as a very informal weekend, kind of here t teaching parents about what college was, telling students to sign up for standardized tests. And then it became uh, a bi-weekly in-school program in six schools. Um, and the programming itself consisted of these after-school meetings, which were a mix of kind of leadership development, college readiness, and uh, kind of uh, cultural heritage programming. It also had local trips, so they'd go to college uh, tours. They would um, go to world uh, workplace tours as well to see what are the other fields that I could, could enter into. And ca individual case management of students' college applications. It served around 500 learners. Um, 150 were regular participants, and that's who I drew the pool of my interviews from. Uh, and by regular participants, I mean people who attended three or more sessions of the, of the programming. And to give you a sense of who the participants are, um, all of the students were uh, pretty low income to lower middle class. Um, the schools themselves were serving about 60 to, 70, 60 to 80 percent uh, free and reduced lunch and a uh, uh, large proportion of those students were, were represented in Succeeders. They were majority Mexican and Central American, and uh, over half of them were undocumented. And I should mention also that these, are, these students were, were going to be the first ones to finish high school in their family, and the first ones to finish college if they got in. So what I found was, how were these young people who are poised to, to make this big educational step, how are they thinking about their educations? What do they mean to them? And it's both this, this fulfillment of an intergenerational uh, sense of obligation that my parents came here to give me a better life and now I'm going to, to perform that through going to school, but also into a city where they are a new population and where do we fit? That performing well in school was a way to demonstrate that you were and could be a full member of this community of, of Nashvillians, of Americans. And so in order to do that, students kind of thought about their educations in two main ways. 
they were pursuing it as a way to show that they weren't like, as many students would say, that kind of Latino or that kind of Mexican, right? To, to say the stereotypes of, um, uh, they would very easily be able to, to list them off of, um, were not into, Mexican-Americans don't value education or uh, Mexican men tend to work with their hands, right? And they would say, I wanna show, and particularly for the young women, they would say, I, I'm not going to get pregnant, right? I'm going to go to school. And in some ways, as they asserted their difference from those stereotypes, you kind of have to assume that there are people that fit them. And for many of them, that becomes a big challenge when, as one student said, I don't wanna be like my cousins who got pregnant and left school, but that comes at a cost of devaluing one's cousins, right? And that can be a very uh, difficult thing to live with on the inside. The other way that, uh, that, that as students kind of came to grips with that difficult position of living between wanting to show that you're different, but also having that come at the cost of feelings of intimacy with your loved ones, young people were transforming belonging by saying, Education can be a way to meet that, uh, meet those obligations to the people who have cared for me and saying I'm here not in spite of my cousins but because of them, because they provided other forms of care for me. They may not have modeled what it was to be a good student, but they supported me and I'm only able to do this because of them. And a way to kind of reclaim those people's social value uh, through this kind of more collective understanding of education educational attainment. So I'm just gonna give you a few examples here of how students talked about that to kind of give you a, a sense. And so, um, also these are all pseudonyms, uh, and in, to get to that point about stereotypes, this young woman said, I'm gonna choose the most Mexican name possible. I wanna be Lupita, right? And so, you know, they, even in that choice, right, we see how the young people are kind of figuring out what it means to be who they are. And so, again, I mentioned that they were able to kind of point out what all these stereotypes were. And so this is what she said that she was reacting to. The average Hispanic girl gets pregnant at 16. The boy drops out during high school, works in construction. They're not very educated. They can't speak English very well. They're just not very bright. And for her, she felt that that was something that she had to combat every time that she entered a, a debate. Right? She was an active debater in high school that people thought that that's who she would be. And so she said, and she had instances where people said, oh, you did a great job, I didn't expect that, right? So she's getting that feedback also from knowing that that's coming and, and having to deal with that. So she was also had worked as a, a cleaner in a, in a house uh, with this older woman who would talk about how her son went to this slightly selective college in the Southeast, and that inspired um, Lupita to apply to that college because as she said, I felt like that woman looked down on me. And I asked, why, why then would you wanna to go to this college if it seems like this isn't a place that might welcome you? And she said, if I go to that school, I'm just as good as her son, and it's not because of race, it was because I was able to get into that school. We went through the same admissions process. That doesn't make him better than me just because he's white and I'm Hispanic. It's almost my way to prove that I'm just as good as you are. So, she, and I asked, how are you showing that, right? And she said, I have at least 10 essays that say I'm Hispanic. Um, and, but again, reasserting that value that she's not that kind of Hispanic. I'm different, but I understand what it's like to be an American, and I'm not just like the typical Hispanic. And I asked her to, to you know, describe what that meant. She goes, I don't know, just to say very Hispanic-y, right? And then she went through and said, again, it's that getting pregnant, going into certain types of jobs. So in that instance with, with Lupita, we see that she's, uh, let me see, go back to that slide. She's reinforcing those stereotypes, right? Naming those as what people expect of her. And in some ways, that reinscribes their value as an explanation of what uh, school success for Latinx folks looks like or doesn't look like. So to get to the transforming of belonging, I'm gonna return to Lupita. Um, but these other two young women, and it was not all young women I worked with, but um, their quotes are particularly juicy. Uh, so Marina was speaking at a, a 
a program where she was on a panel that young people were, were uh, from the organization were learning about what it means to go to college, what you can expect, what's there. And she was also an uh, undocumented young person and active in the immigrants' right, rights movement in Nashville. And she was talking about the difficulties of enrolling in school, getting money for school as an undocumented person. But then she stopped and said, my mom had dreams for me. That's why I'm here. I'm not mad she brought me here without documents. I have this dream to go to college because she did that. And we see in the broader narratives around young people like Marina, the, the so-called dreamers, right, that these young people have been brought by no fault of their own uh, to come to the United States and we shouldn't punish them. At the same time, their parents are being deported in record numbers at the, at the time I did this research. And it assumes that the blame that these young people are kept from as no fault of their own, the fault belongs to the parents. And here Marina is asserting that a good thing, her education came from what we think of as a bad thing, undocumented migration. So later, to give you kind of a sense of what ethnographic work looks like, these young people, I'm in a meeting, they're supposed to be doing skits about uh, challenges they may face and how to do effective communication in them. And one of the skits was, you, you're, you need to study for a test, your mom has to go to work, but your little brother needs help with his homework. What do you do? And so, Across all of the schools that I watched this skit at, the response was never ignore your sibling, right? It was always help your sibling study together. In fact, in one school, the bad skit of the ineffective communication was to shut the door where you were studying and to leave your sibling by themselves. And so as they were talking about the skits and the wrap up around them, one young woman who actually at the time had to bring her younger sibling to the after school meeting, he was about 10 and he was just going crazy with all the Doritos that he had found from the other students that they, they gave out a snack. And she was saying school is important but family is number one. What Elena, the girl who was performing in the skit uh, and helping her brother did was put her education with her family. So here we see that narrative of how educational attainment can be not just about pro proving individual stereotypes wrong, but also about how to incorporate others into one's success. Uh, this was Lupita. As I mentioned, I did those follow-ups. This is about when she was about to graduate from college, and she described how she went into college, feeling that I was above my demographic because I was in school, and I felt like I actually had a future and that she was a self-loathing brown girl that rationalized her experiences by hating her community. What happened here in the, you know, this, this process of education for Lupita ended up coming full circle, where education was a way to escape the stereotype, but in college she actually kind of dealt with those feelings about that, took classes around migration and around uh, ethnic studies, and was able to see that her view of education and proving individual stereotypes wrong was rooted in this, um, as she says, self-loathing. And that the experience of education can also be transformative to thinking through what, uh, who we are. So I try to end on a positive note there for you. Uh, Professor Scudero. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Escudero. I'm an assistant professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies here at Brown. Uh, really excited to be speaking with you all about uh, my book, Organizing While Undocumented, which came out in March 2020, right before the world became the way it is now. Um, and so I wanted to begin by talking about the experiences of Ireri. Uh, Ireri is an undocumented activist and organizer from Chicago, and as you can see, there's a photo of Ireri in the center, and then her parents, Rosi and Martin, are on either side. And Ireri is an undocumented student um, and young person from the greater Chicago area, and Ireri ended up uh, receiving DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and after receiving her DACA status, uh, she wanted to renew it. 
and her renewal was denied. And when her attorney asked why her renewal was denied, they said because she took part in an act of civil disobedience uh, to protest the unfair treatment of undocumented immigrants, that she was a threat to public security and public safety, and so they denied her request to reapprove re her DACA. Uh, she ended up suing the federal government and winning uh, and having her DACA renewed. And so this instance of an undocumented person, of somebody who is in a very precarious situation in the United States yet asserts rights and power in this way, um, is one of the vignettes that I wanted to begin with um, when talking about undocumented experiences. Uh, should I do it right? Uh, and this is a quote from David. Um, and it says, sorry, I'm gonna try to read it. Uh, it says, growing up in Southern California as an undocumented immigrant, my immigration status was not something that my family or others in our community placed much attention on. It wasn't until I graduated high school and applied to college that I realized what being undocumented meant. And then he continues on to say, uh, in college, I started seeing how in my own organizing and involvement with different organizations on campus that was really dividing my identity up into these spaces. My work at the Gender Equity Resource Center meant being gay. My work at the Chicano Latino Student Development Office meant being a student of color. And organizing with the Multicultural Immigrant Student Program meant being an immigrant. Um, and then he goes on to say how he brought those identities together uh, through taking courses on feminist scholarship, queer of color scholarship, ethnic studies scholarship. And so uh, for me, this quote from David is really powerful because it shows the ways in which being an undocumented person is not an all-encompassing status. That yes, you're afraid of deportation, you have fear. Um, the system is designed to instill fear in people on an everyday basis so that they would potentially self-deport. Um, yet, Dave, David is talking about the ways that other aspects of his identity, being a queer person, being a person of color, uh, being a student, are very salient and relevant. And so for me, I wanted to look at the power of undocumented communities speaking back um, to structures of power and also the ways in which they saw themselves differently than perhaps how the legal narratives and frameworks in the US today tend to paint our understandings of undocumented folks. Um, just some context. Um, that undocumented immigrants, there's about 11.2 million undocumented folks in the United States as an estimate, though we know it's a large undercount. Um, and there's about 2.1 million who are under the age of 18 or members of the 1.5 generation. So folks who came here at a young age uh, as undocumented young people, but then ended up growing and being socialized as adolescents in the United States. Um, some of the quotes talk about watching the same shows on TV, uh, having the same hobbies and pastimes, uh, being able to quote pass for members of the second generation. Um, and undocumented immigrants are not all Latinx. Uh, the majority are, as you can see from these stats, but there are a significant number of African, Asian, uh, and European and Canadian undocumented immigrants in the United States. Um, so in the book, I asked how do undocumented immigrants who are criminalized under the law utilize their multiple social identities, racial, gender, sexual orientation, and legal status, and the intersections of those identities in order to form a social movement. Um, and this social movement is one that you've probably seen on the news, dreamers, DACA, undocumented folks. Um, and so in a very social science-y way, uh, I came up with this identity mobilization model which attempts to discuss the ways that a personal experience like identity is tied to, to a structural concept such as racism, homophobia, illegality um, that's experienced in a, in a structural and institutionalized way. And it begins with folks um, and the first step um, community knowledge sharing practices of just getting to know one another, like having a conversation and saying, I'm undocumented and I'm Asian, you're undocumented and you're Latinx, but you know, we both have this undocumented status, let's talk and share and learn about each other's experiences. And this happened as people were sitting next to each other at meetings, they were grabbing meals together, they were organizing, and you wait a long time at an act of civil disobedience as you're getting arrested, and so you can have these conversations with your peers and motivate one another or, you know, support each other. The second part is a, a leveraging of an intersectional identity. So when you might have an identity like being queer and undocumented, that in queer spaces you might talk about undocumented issues, in undocumented spaces you might talk about queer issues, and you might bring those uh, considerations and concerns up in spaces where other people who don't share those intersectional identities, uh, feel they might not feel comfortable doing so. 
And the last part is allyship. Um, a lot of times we think of allyship as a way to relate to people in a particular movement or marginalized group. And I found that high stakes allyship was useful in discussing the ways that people who were spouses of undocumented folks, formerly undocumented folks, um, folks who just uh, had some kind of personal connection to the issue but they themselves were not directly impacted, felt motivated to participate. And so I wanted to kind of name what the uniqueness of that identity was and how it played out for people. So these strategies, the community knowledge sharing practices, the strategically asserting an intersectional identity and in organizing spaces, and then the uh, kind of high stakes allyship were ways that I saw people overcoming the barriers to participation in politics as undocumented immigrants. Um, oh, this is the old version of the slideshow. Um, but I wasn't gonna do the quotes anyway because I think uh, we might not have time for that. Um, but in some of the quotes that I was showing, each chapter talks about one community. Um, so one chapter talks about being Asian and undocumented. One chapter talks about being undocumented and queer. And the other one talks about being formerly undocumented and the ways that people navigated those identities and then tied them to their roles in activism and organizing. Um, so we are going to talk about the Migration Studies Initiative at Brown, which is rooted in our own experiences and our own research, um, but also our work with students here on campus. Um, let's see. So Migration Studies Initiative came out of a couple moments here on campus. The first one is that students called for um, an increased focus on migration with more inclusive pedagogy. So students, a lot of students on campus come from immigrant backgrounds and immigrant families, and we're looking to connect with faculty who also had immigrant experiences such as ourselves, um, or as being the child of immigrants. Uh, my mom is a refugee from Vietnam. She's been Vietnamese in Cambodia, and my dad is an immigrant from Bolivia. Um, so being Asian, Latinx, kind of shapes my approach to this work. And so students were looking to connect with faculty who come from similar backgrounds and do research on this topic um, and share that identity. Uh, students also were looking for independent concentration. So we have students who've done migration studies, independent concentrations. Uh, and so we were talking to a lot of those students who said, I want to do an IC in, in migration studies. And we saw more and more students doing that. And so we thought maybe we could bring them together and, and have an initiative. Uh, the last part is um, being responsible to being members of the Providence community. There are a lot of immigrants in Providence. It's a very diverse community particularly Latinx immigrants, and you go to Pawtucket, Central Falls, nearby cities, you'll see that as well. So we wanted to make sure that we were being responsible to the community that Brown and um, you know, the students are living and situated in. And um, so what is MSI, um, or we call it MSI, Migration Studies Initiative? It is an interdisciplinary hub for migration studies on campus, so we welcome students, faculty, staff, community to come and check it out. Um, it consists of graduate students, undergraduates, faculty, staff, and we're working to build partnerships with local community organizations. And uh, we're a unique collaboration, so a lot of times, uh, even though Brown is a very porous place and we have a lot of collaboration, there are moments where academics are one side and student activism is another side. And so we really try to bridge those spaces for students um, and for members of the campus community. All right. Okay, so when we uh, think about our goals, we have kind of three major areas that we're working on, as, as Kevin mentioned, building this intellectual community and developing a centralized interdisciplinary academic network at Brown. And that means, right, bringing together uh, all stakeholders. Uh, we have fac senior faculty, junior faculty, postdocs, grad students, undergrads, uh, and in, or, in, in many of cases, we have research assistantships coming out of people meeting in this, in this network. Uh, we also support students' navigation of migration studies by listing courses that students can take, uh, by uh, having events where they can find out more about uh, where there, there may be opportunities to get involved with, uh, with their um, faculty members and their projects. And then uh, promoting reciprocal approaches to engaging in community-based research here at, in, in Rhode Island. There are many organizations that uh, Brown students participate in that often 
uh, have needs to uh, look for increased funding or outreach. And so figuring out a way of how uh, folks who aren't going to live here, maybe for the rest of their lives, right? You, you're hoping they come back home. Um, but as they live here for the four years, uh, how do you engage meaningfully with uh, people who this is their home, right? And you're kind of coming in, maybe doing work for a while. How do you make it sustainable beyond yourself? So giving a sense of, of what the activities of MSI look like, we just pulled up some images here. We have a academic spe speaker series in the past. That's the Learning from Ing Immigrant Youth, Language Brokering in Time of Cultural Pol Polarization. We've had speakers come in um, to present about kind of cutting edge research and community partnerships. We've had uh, student facing, MSI is unique in that it's a partnership between an academic center, the population study and training center, and the UFLY student support center, the undocumented first gen and low income center. And so we have more academic events and things like the undocu friendship and the community that allow students to kind of uh, think more broadly than just what fusty old academics think about all day, right? Uh, we also have the migration, uh, interdisciplinary migration working group that workshops papers and uh, uh, grant proposals, and we've had several successful publications come out from students and successful grants. And also we have a social media presence, as you see up in the corner, faculty members sharing about their research experiences. So, uh, we'd like to open it up if anyone has any questions and our, um, if you wouldn't mind going up to the, the mic in the uh, center aisle. Thanks for that talk. Um, we're from Memphis, Tennessee, so that it's close to home. What's happening in Nashville? Nashville's growing very quickly. Um, question I have, I don't know if you mentioned, what are the graduation rates for African Americans mm -hmm. in Nashville mm -hmm. as opposed to Hispanics, as mm -hmm. opposed to Yeah, white so people? they're higher. Um, it's more in the 86% versus 73% range versus 63 for ELLs. Uh, so it's um, about, a f the, for, for white students, um, it's closer to 90. Okay. And for African-American students, depending on the school, that th so that overall for the Metro Nashville Public Schools, it's more in the 80s uh, to, se to the low 70s, depending on which school you're in. So, um, but for Latinx students, it's seven, around 72 and for ELLs, around 63. Gotcha. Are there organizations, uh, some of these nonprofits that are helping mm -hmm. African-American populations yes. also? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Because in Memphis, that's a, that's a big issue in Memphis. Right, very so very Memphis. graduation African-Americans. Right, so uh, it's interesting thinking about the history of Tennessee in this way, that Memphis has a much larger African-American population. Nashville is much smaller, and historically, um, it has, uh, been slightly more economically um, advantaged than folks in Memphis. Yeah. Um, however, there's there's a partner organization that looks a lot like Succeeders that works with African American students, and you also see improved graduation rates with them. And there's also other uh, African American specific um, organizations in Nashville as well. Thank you all for doing this research and for sharing it with us. Um, I teach in a, I teach all English language learners, mm -hmm. ninth and 10th grade. Um, and in our context, in the context that I teach in, they've all just arrived in the United States. Mm -hmm. So they're all, the ninth graders come in um, and typically been in the, the country for two or three months when they, when they come to me. Um, I teach government and, and history. It's interesting to hear we also have lots of students in our school who have been here for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. um, the great majority, it's a diverse, it's very, the demographics are very much like what you described in Nashville in terms of the number of languages in our high schools, 100, over 100 languages in our high school. Um, but the, 
the experience of the recent immigrants, the way that they would describe their education, feels very different sure. for lots of reasons the way that you described. And I wondered if um, they haven't, I mean, having just arrived, a lot of the, I think sort of the baggage that one picks up as one has been here in terms of the way that, that they are perceived hasn't fully developed yet. And I wondered if you had any sense in your work um, about, the, about sort of the, the way that newly arrived immigrants those who have been here a year or two or less, how they see themselves and the way that they sort of imagine their future? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the literature, they talk, uh, scholars talk about the dual frame of reference that re more recent migrants have to say, well, sure, the school isn't great, but back home it was even worse, right, in X, Y, Z ways. So certainly we do see an awareness of the process of racialization for folks who have been here longer, or folks like Lupita, who was born here, but her parents are monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, and I think that, uh, interestingly, in the club, we had newcomer students come in, and uh, the teacher who was facilitating said, okay, make sure you speak in Spanish so that they feel included. And myself and the women running the program did it, but the students did not, right? So there was a challenge there of more recent students n not necessarily gelling with this group of folks who were, as, as uh, Kevin mentioned, part of the 1.5 generation. I, and in the work that I did, some of the young people were, were kind of in between those two, two groups, had come maybe a few years ago. And certainly they were aware that there were stereotypes, but maybe not as strongly as as Lupita, for example. Do you have anything you want to add to that? No? Is that, is that? No, that, that's helpful, thank you. Yep. Thank you for the presentation, both of you. Um, I, I found it very interesting that the newer generation of immigrants are kind of both burdened with trying to make something on their own in, in the United States as well as being advocates for their parents or other family members. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if you guys have any insights or comments about the psychological aspect of being a young person and having the burden mm -hmm. of being a legal advocate, trying to make your own way in the world and being responsible for others at an mm -hmm. age where, you know, my kid doesn't have that burden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start? Or? Um, yeah, no, thanks for that question. I mean, I think that for the undocumented folks that I talked to and worked with who came largely at a young age, so prior to 10, 12 years old and grew up and were socialized in the US, that they had siblings who were documented and so they were in mixed status families, and so those documented siblings would be called upon, you know, if they can get a license to drive the parents someplace, or if they had an ID that they could, you know, register for something, or, you know, do some of the translation work. And then the undocumented 1.5 folks could also do some of that, but their status became a barrier or a challenge to it. Um, but I also found examples where it was flipped. So some of the undocumented parents had been um, very strong advocates and activists in Mexico. And so they would come and they would tell their young kids that you have to get involved, you have to fight for your rights as an immigrant in the US because this is kind of what we do. And so it was really interesting to see, you know, my mom took me to church and the church had this group and we were doing this event to organize and then I decided to, you know, disclose my status and get involved and now I'm one of the leaders. So that was kind of one of the narratives of, of Luna who's in the book. And so I think that there were these examples where um, sometimes the parents' own organizing histories played an impact in terms of how students saw their role as supporting the family. Um, and also I think with mixed status families, it played out in interesting ways as well. And from a, a, a psychological perspective, right, this, it, when we think of adolescence, the main work of it is forming what we think of as our emerging adult identities, right? And so it is a period where, um, where these additional uh, challenges are impactful in how they think about themselves and certainly um, we see that there, from people doing more psychologically uh, focused research, there, there, are, there is evidence of increased mental stress and, um, and certainly um, a sense of increased responsibility at a young age that sometimes can come at the expense of these own young people's 
for example, academic trajectories. So in an article that I've written based on this research, actually focusing a little bit on Lupita again, who was, as I mentioned, her mother um, is a monolingual Spanish speaker. She was started doing the bills from a very early age because her father went moved back up to the Northeast where they had originally settled because the construction work was more lucrative there and could fund a, a comfortable life in Tennessee. So from the age of 10, she was doing the bills, translating for her mother, and often serving as kind of a second parent figure. She had trouble with that, right? Like she, she said her mother messed up one time and said, watch your kids. And Lupita kind of snapped back and said, they're not my kids, they're my siblings. I feel like my mother's husband. And so I do think that that was challenging for her. But at the same time, um, she and other young people who were tasked with those responsibilities said, well, I feel bad that my siblings never learned how to do that. They're not as independent as me or as responsible as me. So I think psychologically, yes, it's an increased stressor for young people, but a lot of it has to do with how, whether they find community with other young people, and that was a, a benefit of the Succeeders Club, is that folks like Lupita could find out they weren't the only ones doing that and so that they were able to kind of share strategies. I mean, it was very odd for me at the time. I didn't have a child. Um, my child's now running barefoot with my husband out there. Um, but they would talk like veteran parents, like, oh, well, that third grade teacher, that's gonna be a tough year. And so you kind of, there she is. Uh, and so you kind of saw that they were developing these skills and what uh, I think we need to think about as educators is how we value those skills in the classroom and understand that that's also impacting young people's learning. And that when you're doing translation, it's not just thinking about it as, uh, uh, one language to another, but what academic skills young people might be picking up as well as they think about new types of vocabulary, uh, new genres of speaking that they're mastering, but that, that sometimes that additional work that immigrant young people are doing outside of the classroom doesn't get valued in the classroom, and how we can create a space for, for healthy psychological development that also um, sees what they're doing not as a burden, but as something that could be potentially useful. I brought shoes for her. I don't know <laughs> where they went. <laughs> We're being simulcast, so we have to be miked. Uh, that was a very interesting and uh, educating uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a question. You know, we always uh, read about uh, the, mic uh, the undocumented or um, the illegal migration on the borders, always in the news so much, um, and uh, also about DACA, uh, children brought here by their parents. Um, so what happens to the undocumented children after they finish high school. Um, I know by law they're allowed to go to high school. They're supposed to get an education, and which is good. Uh, but what happens after that? When they don't have papers, when they don't have uh, documentation, uh, how do they go to college, state, or private? Uh, what happens after that? Um, no, that's a great question. Uh, so a lot of the undocumented students, yeah, they're guaranteed an access to K-12 education through Plyler v. Doe, a U.S. Supreme Court case, which says that they couldn't be excluded uh, from public K-12 education. But then for college, it's up to where you live. Um, so if you're in a state that has policies that allow undocumented students to go to local colleges and universities, these are public institutions, then they can go. Um, so I grew up in California. California has AB 540, which allows undocumented students um, to establish establish um, a, a form of residency that lets them pay in-state tuition to affordably attend a UC school, a Cal State school. But if you live in Georgia, perhaps, Georgia has a ban on undocumented students from attending the top five institutions in the state, and so those students have to look out of state. Um, and private institutions in the Northeast are very 
um, desirable for undocumented students because they provide great amounts of financial aid um, and they need blind oftentimes in the admissions process. So students tend to go to small liberal arts colleges in the North sea, Northeast um, or to kind of private institutions that have scholarships and that have more flexible spending of their, of their endowments and of their aid to support the students, whereas the public institutions have the challenge of, um, you know, whatever state laws say and, and they can do. And so a lot of students um, end up going to those colleges. Um, but a lot of the undocumented students that I worked with also were in Chicago. So Chicago, um, Illinois allows undocumented students to pay in state tuition as well, um, and New York as well. So those were the three sites that I worked in, Chicago, uh, New York, and San Francisco, where they had more kind of uh, receptive environments supporting undocumented students pursuing higher education. So for in, in Tennessee, uh, their students can attend schools that are in the, um, the regions system, but in the UT system, there's an unofficial ban on undocumented students. Um, and so you can apply to what students say is that you can apply to these schools and, and you won't get in. Um, also, Tennessee has no in-state tuition for students with uh, DACA or who are undocumented. What has, so that means even at the community college level, if a class is $500 for in-state, it's $1,500 for an undocumented person. So if you are a student who struggled in high school, barely graduated, and maybe you're thinking, I'll go to the community college to start out, and if you have to take remedial coursework, it might take you six years to get that associate's degree. It's also coming at three times the cost as your uh, fellow learners. Um, so what we see is for high achieving undocumented students, often as, as Kevin mentioned, private liberal arts colleges or in, in the Southeast, private religious colleges will offer uh, merit-based scholarships through private money. Um, and be able to attend. That's only going to select for the young people who are particularly bright or test well or are coming from a strong academic background. But for young people who may have gone the community college route to a four-year degree, those paths become blocked unless they have the funds to do so. But if many of those funds are tied to academic achievement, they're, they're not gonna get those. And then you have kind of the middle students who might be, had done fine in high school, but they're not going to get, uh, 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 for example, one of the private Christian colleges that the students went to had a tiered system. If you scored this much on the ACT, SAT, you got 5,000. If you scored this much more, you got 10. And so you had to score in a certain level to get those uh, scholarships. So for students who did fine, you're not going to set the world on fire with your standardized test score and you might not get the money that you need for college. And because they are, um, some states like uh, Texas have their own uh, state financial aid that they'll provide for students, but undocumented students are FAFSA, FAFSA ineligible, so they can't receive st state or federal aid. So for many students who are kind of average to low achieving students, you see their, the college dream that they may have had becomes thwarted because there isn't the funds or if there are the funds, it's really limited to students who are high achievers. So we see then the transition to undocumented work. So it's after 12th grade, depending on the level of achievement in school. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, yeah. They either just stay as a high school graduate, mm -hmm. or if they're high achievers, uh, some private institution may give them some mm -hmm. uh, help, financial aid, mm -hmm. but they continue to stay undocumented. Correct. Even mm -hmm. after graduating from college. Mm -hmm. Yes, unless they have um, some sort of active case outside of their schooling. Like, so the DREAM Act, which was first introduced in 2001, did suggest a pathway to citizenship where undocumented young people had to prove um, their educational attainment levels could be one, one way to get citizenship. Um, but there's no such uh, law in place now. That was just something that was proposed. So they graduate, they're undocumented. If they have deferred action for childhood arrivals, that was, uh, uh, in, 
put in place by the Obama administration, rescinded by the Trump administration, put back in right now, young people who are undocumented get a work authorization. And so for, for example, I had several young women that I worked with that became nurses and then it came time for licensure and they were prior to DACA, they couldn't be nurses. There was no way for them to, to work. They couldn't do the background checks. Um, and then once they had DACA, they were able to get work authorization. But even then, these bureaucratic systems don't always work that quickly. So one young woman thought she had to move to North Carolina because there was a form that actually said DACA on it that she could check, but she wasn't sure if there was such a form in Tennessee. So it really, as, as Professor Escudero mentioned, state to state, what opportunities there are for the documented or undocumented really vary. I don't know if you want to check me on any of those legal. <laughs> no, then I don't say it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you very much. You're welcome. I think so. Yeah. Um, just want to say thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, if you're interested in MSI or, uh, you know, students that you have here at Brown are interested in MSI, I definitely encourage them to check it out. Um, we're hosted by the Population Studies Training Center. So you can go to the PSTC website and then look under initiatives and MSI shows up there. Or you could just ask us. But, yeah, thank you so much.